So another week of our quest through TV. I've been finding that this is kind of neat the further in we go. It's kind of cool because it's like we're building up more of a, a view of how everything was for TV. Like at first it was just here's a random show, there's a random show, but now it's starting to come together in some kind of shape. So I thought we should go with go with how the winds are blowing a little, where last week we accidentally watched the wrong Space Force, so we not only jumped ahead in time, but we also watched a British show inadvertently. So I was thinking, why don't we take a break? We'll go back to the 50s, but let's take a break from America and let's try a British show. Cause, sure. Because you were saying how uh, it seemed so so clear that the American Space Force was really just kind of talking down to people where the British Space Force was not and that that tends to be how British TV seems to be in general, you know? It, and that is always, even to this day, kind of true. Is <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. I guess American TV is a little better now that there's HBO type stuff or whatever. But I was like, what, what was going on in England in the 50s? But it was hard because I did the same thing I was doing for America, where I went down the list of shows, and whenever I saw one that sounded interesting or that I recognized, I'd go look into it. But over and over with the British ones, it would be like, uh, none of these shows exist anymore. No one kept them. So I, I realized, okay, this isn't going to work. I just gave up with that because there's just not archived to the same degree as American stuff. So instead, I just searched for British TV from the 50s. And it's like, let's just see what happens, you know, and let's just see what we got. So uh, I found a little five minute newsreel. So I was like, might as well watch that, see what the BBC newsreels were like in 1951. But the show I found, I found a couple, but the one for this week. So yeah, it's a little more random because it's not stuff that I've heard of. It's just whatever still exists. It's, uh, it's kind of a kid's show, I guess, and it's called Billy Bunter of Greyfriars School. So I take it you never heard of that shit. Never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, let's see. So, I mean, they always have, you know, the, way more of that, like, private school culture over yeah. there. Yeah. Where even today I'd say, like, Harry Potter is the new one. But, like, they're, like terms I don't even understand where they're like, Billy Bunter is... Uh, sixth form lower fourth grade blah 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 like all these fucking school terms that they understand that i don't know what they mean and i always I, I may be wrong but i always had the impression that early television was an american thing right and they jumped right on that bandwagon and be, maybe because they i mean they were making movies in britain of course but they weren't making movies of the caliber that hollywood was making movies right so tv kind of seemed to be an extension of that in the united states and possibly it's just because we are North American that I have that idea. Uh, because the earliest thing I remember seeing of British, of British TV would have been Doctor Who in the early 60s. Right, so Benny still. Hill, you know, later on and that kind of stuff. But we, were, we in Canada didn't seem to be picking up a whole lot of British TV. And I, I always just had the impression that they weren't in the same... They were like Canadian TV. Right. You know, they were kind of like secondary. TV was the was the Americans' um, productions. and. Yeah, no, that from the little research I did, that seems totally true. Yeah, like British TV was regional, <laughs> definitely regional. And I think a reason why a lot of this stuff doesn't exist anymore is because they did just put it out live, you know. Like, it wasn't pre-recorded, and nobody kept a recording of the live broadcast. They just broadcast it out and it disappeared and that was the end of it. Although even back then it seems like they had that same thing that they still do now where instead of how our TV shows are like each season is like 20 or 30 episodes, it's just way too much, where that British idea of the seasons being short, you know, like eight episodes, 10 episodes, even back then they were already doing that, which is helps with the quality, I'm sure. But uh, this one, so... This Grey Friars School thing, it was these comics that ran from 1908 to 1940 in this boys' comic called The Magnet. And after that, they became a series of novels, and they're just about a bunch of kids at this private school having their adventures. So one of the side characters was this fat kid named Billy Bunter, who uh, is just, you know, from what I gather, he was just kind of like... He thinks he's the smartest, he thinks he's the handsomest, he thinks he's the coolest, but he's just a big fat idiot. <laughs> but, uh, but he became so popular that he became the main character. So they tried to make some movies and stuff and it never came together, but they finally made this TV show, which ran from 1952 to 1961. And yet, by this point, it was Billy Bunter was so popular that the show was Billy Bunter of Grey Friars School. 
And just like some of those shows we were saying, like we've run into some shows lately that were popular and they only stopped because somebody died at an inopportune time. Same thing with this. It was popular the whole time, but the guy who wrote the original stories, Charles Hamilton, he also wrote the show. Because again, with this British idea of fewer episodes per season, one guy could write every episode. So this guy wrote all of them and then he died. <laughs> so, so they had to stop the show. Uh, and the other thing I, that seemed a little interesting is this guy, Billy Bunter, even though he's supposed to be like 13 years old or 14 or something, the guy who played him was 29 when the show started, <laughs> al <laughs> already married with two kids. But back when they were trying to make a movie out of this, he was the front runner. They liked him for Billy when he was the appropriate age. So then a decade and a half later, when they finally made the show, they're like, yeah, he's still good. Let's use him. <laughs> well, and, and, and you know what? The Brits can pull that off and make you believe it. When you think of uh, any number of Monty Python skits, yeah. and they've got those completely grown men running around with little like little blazers on, little short pants, and little yeah. little beanie-type hats, um, and you believe it. Although they're fully grown men, but they, they're those young boys, acting like those young boys. So, yeah, I... I it, whereas in an American show, you probably people would say, "Oh, well, you know, you can't have a grown up doing that," but those Brits pull off that stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah, so I guess we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Because from what I gathered too, like a lot of the other characters are actually appropriately aged teenage kids that they would just kind of cycle in and out as they got too old. But Billy Bunter, I mean, he was twenty nine at the start. So he was damn near 40 by the end, or maybe he was 40, and he's still playing this little chubby school kid. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, the other thing that was a little controversial is that he wasn't fat enough. Billy in the stories was a real fat fuck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he had to wear a fat suit. So, so we'll see. So yeah, they made 52 episodes. Again, so yeah, not that many for such a long run. Uh, and nine still exist to this day, so the quality's not going to be good. It's going to be pretty rough, but just that any of them exist at all is a miracle. So this one is called Bunter on the Warpath from 1956. So, okay. So we'll get our first, our first, not our first taste of England, I guess our second, but well, last here, week's was okay, an accident. One more comment about the quality, but we'll have to see how, what the quality of this is like. Right. But uh, I have seen original Coronation Street stuff. Now, it is 1960. Right. Now, by the time 1960 rolls around on American TV, there's pr some pretty top quality stuff. We've seen top quality stuff already from the early 50s. But Coronation Street is pretty rough. <laughs> Black and white, grainy. Production standards don't seem to be paramount with these guys. It's like, let's get the storyline out there and let's get the characters developed, uh, they seem to be more into that than as to whether they've got a really polished production. So I'm not surprised if this thing is very, very rough, because even by 1960, Coronation Street, those early shows are really, really, really rough. So yeah, I guess we'll watch the newsreel first, because it's only five minutes, sure. and then, and then we'll, Billy Bunter. And then we'll watch Billy. Isn't it weird that this isn't a Monty Python skit? Like my only <laughs> sounds like it. Yeah, like my only exposure to British TV is all jokes. It was never serious stuff. <laughs> is that like his catchphrase? I'm gonna cane you. <laughs> uh, I'm inclined to deal with you more lightly. Um, you will take one thousand lights uh, for removing my radio from my study. A thousand? No more? No less. Oh, but sir! Go back to your place, Butter. Oh, 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 oh. But sir, I... Hurt, Butter! <laughs> Well, it's kind of nice that there's a couple, whatever they said, nine episodes of that that survived, because it's not terrible. It's not bad. No, it had a lot of action in it. Yeah. For what, together, those two reels would have been, what, half an hour? Yeah, half an hour, yeah. So uh, I guess first off, I guess we'll just say that the uh, the newsreel 
was definitely different from the American style where they move on every minute and a half to a new topic or whatever. It was like five or six minutes just about a train that they made is pretty, pretty boring. <laughs> so. Definitely. Yeah. Because, yeah, the American take wouldn't have gotten into the details about the train. They would have just said, like, trains, those are exciting, right? Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Here's the Britannia, and it's a blah, 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 blah. And then they would have shown it going off in the distance, and that probably would have been it. <laughs> yeah, because before you have a chance to realize you don't actually care, <laughs> they would have moved on. We're the British on something one. else. <laughs> yeah, so Billy Bunter, like, definitely, uh, so, yeah, I was mentioning how there certainly would have been a laugh track if it was American. So that was a nice change that British stuff even back then just gives it a little more of a feeling of legitimacy like it can maybe stand on its own two feet and here they are in 1951 and they're not hung up with uh language i think it was 56 56 okay but they're continually calling him fat ass yeah so many times (laughs) (laughs) yeah so it does hit that weird mid-ground too of yeah like it's sort of a kid show but yeah they called him fat ass like eight times (laughs) which is like can you imagine an american he is however old he was when this was going on like 29 30 and early 30s whatever he uh he passes off as a yeah as a teenage boy in a prep school yeah definitely i was feeling that like about halfway in i realized like i wasn't thinking about him being old anymore <laughs> you just don't think about it so no and see as i said earlier they're very into developing character which you can buy the fact that he is a teenage boy and their production is not that great it's very uh, static had quite a little plot development for a half hour show well it definitely made me think of harry potter a lot like it made me realize how much of that is just british tropes you know like what might seem kind of like novel to us like oh you go to a wizard school and you stay in the wizard school and everyone dresses in their wizard uniform but this is exactly the same it's just like that that's just normal there i guess it's just like a boarding school you dress in your uniform it's like the evil headmaster is just snape it's the same exact archetype you know so so that's kind of interesting but uh, it also like so much uh quicker or just the pure amount of dialogue is just way more people are talking way more they're talking way faster <laughs> like you really kind of gotta keep up with what everyone's saying and there definitely is no um well, how can i say it often times with american tv they have to put it in your face and then they have to explain it to you this was full of all kinds of innuendo all kinds of facial movements, like when he was listening to Beethoven, and you he never spoke, but you saw the yawn, you saw the rolling of the eyes, the boredom was there without a word being spoken. Yeah, it's like that combination that British stuff does a lot. It's like uh, highbrow and lowbrow. Like they're telling Beethoven jokes and stuff, which is kind of highbrow, but he just can't even stand to hear Beethoven for a second. <laughs> so that's kind of like the lowbrow side of it. Of just like he just hates it. He can't stand it at all. So yeah, it definitely was all focused on this Billy Bunter, just this little fat kid who uh, bought a comic book and uh, the headmaster, the evil headmaster, took it away and then tore it up. The headmaster's a real asshole. So he was just like, ah, I'm, I'm upset that everyone took my comic. But yeah, it's funny how every other character definitely just orbits around Billy Bunter, like he's in the middle, they're all around him talking to him. So on the one hand, it's it's almost like he's the only he's the most important thing in their lives even because they're all just what are you up to with Bunta? Tell me what you're up to, Bunta. Let's do some things, Bunta. But at the same time, they're like, ah, roll away, Bunta, you fat ass. Like they they like they love him and they hate him. It's weird. It's very reminiscent, reminds me so much of of the British comics that I used to read as a kid. And I, used, and I had a bunch of them that I read to you guys when like you were kids. the dandy book and that and type dandy, of stuff? The dandy, the desperate Dan, and very much that <laughs> same kind of character development. Well, yeah, those were British as hell. Remember, is he skint? You know he is. <laughs> or now I know that means, is he poor? Does he have no money? But is he skint? I didn't know what that meant. That's British as shit. <laughs> so, yeah, it is that kind of thing. And I guess even in my, you know, youth, it wasn't that weird to, like... We never got, like, spanked or caned or anything at school, but it was the threat was there. Like, like I think they were already done doing that to kids, but they still threatened it. It was still hanging in the air. Where back then, yeah, this guy, this headmaster, multiple times, not only did he bring up that he was going to cane them, but he's like, I was going to cane you most severely. <laughs> but instead, just write a thousand lines. 
Which I assume they just mean on the blackboard or whatever, just or on, uh, in a notebook. I don't well, know. I don't know. See, they never. They don't explain that. They don't feel they need to. They don't have to give you all that detail. It's enough to say a thousand lines. That's all you need to know. And a thousand. That is a lot. Like, because that was another thing that was still just hanging on when I was in school. But I can't imagine it would have been more than fifty, maybe a hundred. Oh no! See, I, I wrote many, many lines when yeah. I was in school. Many. Like a thousand, though? A uh, thousand's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 500, easily, a lot. And I remember one time writing, uh, wouldn't it, I don't know if it would have been a thousand, but it was in grade five and we had just learned how to do ditto marks. Right. So I wrote about maybe 10 lines and then filled all the rest of the pages with ditto, dittos. To which, when I turned it in, it was, oh, the teacher said, I'm very proud, that, very glad that you learned the use of dittos, but this does not work. Get back there and do the lines. Oh, they didn't even let you get away with it that one time. <laughs> oh, so you'd use all kinds of other methods, like having four pins between your fingers and <laughs> all set up on the lines. I, 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 must, 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 not, 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 talk, talk, talk. In, 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 in. Did that really work? It must have made your, like, legibility go yeah, straight to hell. Yeah, it got pretty crappy, but <laughs> you tried anything. But uh, what about, uh, when, so when you were in school, so you know, still had to write lines, but what was the... Uh, what was the caning situation? Or like, I guess oh. what they called it with us was the strap. Well, the we strap. had the strap. Right. Every teacher had a leather strap. So it did like you a, ever get the strap? I got the strap in grade one. It's the only time I got it. And it was for talking. It was very unjust. Once on each hand. And I guess I blatted my head off so much that I never got it again. Yeah, well, that's That's fair. happened many times, though. Many yeah. times. And I saw many a kid get the strap. By the time I was in junior high school, though, teachers did not strap anymore. The principal did the strapping. <laughs> but someone did. <laughs> you had to go you had to go to the principal. So uh, do you remember did it re like when you got strapped, did it hurt a lot or was it just kind of the shock of it happening? No, it hurt. Okay. Yeah. It friggin' hurt. <laughs> Because I don't know, I always remember like getting spanked and stuff. And as a kid, I don't think it really hurt so much. It's just the indignity. Well, there's the indignity too <laughs> on top of it. Yeah. But really, when you're six years old, there's no reason to be giving anybody a strap. No, but, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It is though, just to get real creepy for a second. But I guess it is all relative. Like it seems crazy to us now to like cane kids and all this crazy fucking corporal punishment shit. But I was listening to a thing about, uh, like, tribes. Like, you know, there's those tribes that still exist nowadays that are almost untouched by modern society and stuff. So you get to see what things were like back in the day. And this one tribe, this guy, was, uh, he was, you know, interviewing people and trying to learn about them. And there was this tribe where it was just this kid who wouldn't stop blatting all the time. And they just took him, one of the adults in the tribe, just took him out into the wilderness and killed him. And everyone else in the tribe was like, you know, I wish we could have thought of a better way around that, but that kid just would not fucking shut up. <laughs> so it's like way back in the tribal days, you didn't just get caned or something. You got fucking put in the ground. <laughs> and yeah. it seems so awful to like kill a kid. But on the other hand, man, kids are annoying sometimes. And, like, <laughs> you know, we've almost gone to the other extreme now. Yeah. Uh, you can't even have that threat of the cane or the strap. Because many times when I was a kid in school, all it took was the teacher would call you up to the desk and open the top of her desk, and <laughs> there it was. She didn't even have to take it out. There it was, that black strap. Or if the whole class was there doing something bad, they would just take out that strap and on, the hand, on their hand, just a little tap, tap, tap. And many times that was enough for kids to just say, oh, okay, I'm not pushing myself any further. I'm shutting up. Right. But nowadays, there's nothing like that. And sometimes that little bit of fear, I don't think you should be going out strapping kids and giving them the cane and all that stuff. But that little bit of fear, that little bit of intimidation to say, I'm the boss, I'm the teacher, not you. Kids talk back all the time because nothing can happen to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is definitely that. Uh, I definitely don't ascribe to that idea that kids are just innocent. Like, I think kids are kind of potentially worse than adults because they don't know where the line is. They and don't. And they'll know. keep trying to push the line, and if there's nothing there that can push it back, yeah, too bad. Teachers are at their mercy. So the other thing that definitely brought back some memories or whatever, but not so much of school, but the. Uh, so the teacher, the whole plot was that this evil headmaster stole Billy Bunter's uh, comic. He saved up four pence to buy this horror comic, and the teacher took it. And uh, and that's fair, whatever, take the, the comic during school hours. But Because that happened to me a lot in school where they'd take my shit. 
But then you got it back after school, you know? You usually had to go up and ask, like, can I get my Transformer back? And the teacher would be like, oh, fine, and open the drawer and give you the thing back. But this dude destroyed the now, fucking comic. things have changed, but you got to remember now, this is 1956. Right. These boys are at a prep school. They're supposed to be learning serious stuff. Comic books were treated as being almost like pornography. Yeah. Or just cheap crap and... Uh, it would be totally unacceptable for you to be reading that stuff. Even when I was in school, there was it wasn't like severe like that, but you were not supposed to be reading comic books. Come on, that's just tripe. What that made me think of, though, which is weird, is not school. It was when I was a full-grown adult when I got that coffee shop job in Vancouver in like 2005. And uh, the guy who ran the coffee shop was this dude from South Korea who was, like, in the military. He was a real hard ass. And he warned everyone, if you leave anything in the staff room, I'm going to throw it away. But uh, the first volume of the Scott Pilgrim comic had just come out. And those were, like, the thick ones, like, 300-page, whatever, $20 comic. And I just forgot it in the back room. I just totally forgot. So the next day, I was like, hey, have you seen my my thing? And he's like, I told you. If I left it in the back room, I was going to throw it away. And I did. And that guy has no idea what a mistake he made that day. Because up until that point, I mean, I'm, I like to think generally a good person. I was trying to show up to work on time and work hard and do my stuff right as much as I hated that job. I stole from that guy from that day on so much. Because I'm like, first, the way I justified it was just, well, he owes me $20. Because what an asshole. He couldn't wait one day. He threw away my comic. What a fucking dick. You know, we had like fancy cheesecake where it's like $5 a slice and just all kinds of stuff in there. So I was like, yeah, I'll just... It's so easy to fudge the books. I'm the only one here all night. I'm working graveyard shift. I'm just going to stuff my face with stuff and make up my 20 bucks. But then I realized how easy it was and that I hated him. And... uh <laughs> I mean, over the course, I worked there for another, like, eight months. I can't even imagine how much I fleeced that guy for. And I wouldn't have, but he threw away my fucking comic book. So when I saw this headmaster rip up Billy Bunter's comic, it brought that back. <laughs> like, like, I was, like, 25 years old, and I was still like, nope, sorry, pal, you just, you just fucked up. <laughs> well, that's the whole premise of this story that we just watched. Billy was going to get back for his comic book, and he was going to steal the most valuable thing that that man had, which was his wireless radio. Yeah. They just don't have to keep kind of pounding the message to us. They just told the story, and you take it or leave it. Yeah. And enjoy it. And I find that very much with British television. There's uh, half the time you're spending a good amount of time trying to follow along with the um, accents. Yeah, that obviously makes it a little tougher for us. You miss, you miss <laughs> certain words. But even without that, it's like that rhythm is different, where in American shit, you tell the joke and then you pause yeah. for reaction. And sometimes that works like, again, Jack Benny, you know, looks right at the camera and, and it's funny. But a lot of times it is just you talk, you wait for the laugh. And then where this does not wait. Like no, if you got to just keeps on rolling. You either get it or you don't. Yeah. Yeah, which is, helps, I think, with those weird innuendos and weird stuff that they say. Because you're like, wait, what did he just say? But then they're moving on to something else. So you almost don't even have time to parse it. And I guess that's what it is a little weird that Billy Bunter is the breakout character. Because he's like a weird mix of like he is kind of legitimately kind of annoying and sort of witless and stupid. But I guess that's what makes him entertaining is that he's he's witless in a good way like he's just overly confident about himself he doesn't realize everyone hates him he thinks he's got all of his but they don't all hate him that's the thing that's kind of weird about it because all those boys at first they cajole along with him and they make fun of him and all that stuff but when it comes down to him taking the blame for that business with the coin there's a bunch of them that stand up from him and make the other two boys come good kind yeah. of explain what they did which is funny too because yeah i think i even noticed in that scene that uh yeah like they're like you can't let bunta take the fall but then i think they did call him a fat ass later <laughs> in that scene <laughs> you know, so. oh they continually called him a fat ass but i guess that's kind of like british too right or like irish all that all those uh, that area where it's like you most people i've he heard this story over and over like you grow up with a sarcastic family and they teach you to be kind of witty and to put up with you know, you, you learn how to roll with an insult because that's just how people talk, you know? So, so I mean, that all seems to kind of fit, too. And nobody commented at any point in time, like, oh, you shouldn't call him that or that will make him feel bad if you say that. Everybody called him that, yeah. except for the professor. Right. I was thinking it, though. 